Today we will, re we will receive two presentations. The first from Ms. Christina Sullivan, consultant with the Gulf and Caribbean Fisheries Institute, and she will present the highlights of the report. Following Christine's presentation, we will hear from Ms. Francis Lean, Executive Director of the Roatan Marine Park. Ms. Lean will present on building capacities for monitoring and intervention for SCTLD. However, before we begin, I invite Ms. Ileana Lopez, the Program Officer for the Specially Protected Areas Wildlife Subprogram at the Cartagena Convention Secretariat to provide opening remarks. Ms. Lopez will be followed by Mr. Robert Glazer, Executive Director of the Gulf and Caribbean Fisheries Institute, who will provide remarks as well as speak on the importance of partnerships. Eliana? Muchas gracias, Tamoy. Thank you, Tamoy. Uh, buenos días, bonjour, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening for those that are already in Europe in the evening. As uh, expressed by Tamoy, my name is Ileana Lopez. I am the program officer for the specially protected areas and wildlife subprogram at the UNEP Cartagena Convention Secretariat in Kingston, Jamaica. On behalf of the Secretariat, I give you the warmest welcome and it's my pleasure uh, to welcome you to this webinar, as explained before, to launch the white paper on stony coral tissue, loss disease. I will be providing the opening remarks for today's event. But before to start, I would like to appreciate uh, the Ministry of Environment of Sweden for providing the resources, the financial resources uh, for um, this um, white paper. As you are aware, the Cartagena Convention Secretariat is a regional legal agreement for the protection and development of the marine environment of the wider Caribbean region. Stony coral tissue loss disease is one of the latest in a series of emerging issues that uh, we are tackling as part of the Secretariat. For example, in the past um, couple of years ago, we were uh, working very highly with the lionfish invasion, and more recently with the pelagic sargassum influx that are affecting the wider Caribbean region, marine environment, and which falls on the Cartagena Convention's sphere of cooperation. Uh, for those of you that uh, are not aware, I would like to kind of introduce you with how we are structured. Uh, we have three protocols. One is the protocol concerning cooperation in combating oil spills in the wider Caribbean region. This is our first protocol. The co protocol concerning uh, what I represent uh, as, as a program officer, the protocol concerning especially protected areas and wildlife in the wider Caribbean region, and the protocol concerning pollution from land-based sources of activities. And uh, you will hear later on from my colleague, Mr. Christer, Christopher Corbin. Contracting parties are obliged uh, to prevent, reduce, and control pollution of the convention area and ensure sound environmental management through best practices means um, in accordance with their capabilities. And or contracting parties, uh, as far as today, 26, should also take appropriate measures to protect and preserve rare or fragile ecosystems, as well as the habitat of depleted, threatened, and endangered species in the convention area. The convention also recommends that contracting parties cooperate with uh, all, uh, when appropriate, in scientific research monitoring and the exchange of data and other scientific information in relation to the convention. The potential role of these protocols in relation to the SCTLD as uh, we are working today is, the SPA protocol requires the contracting parties to take all necessary measures to protect, preserve, and manage in a sustainable way areas that require protection to safeguard their potential value and threaten and endangered species of flora and fauna. As we know, we work with marine protected areas, flora, fauna, and the use of the ecosystem-based management approach and other tools for the conservation of the environment. 
The wider Caribbean region, as expressed before, is comprised of 28 contracting parties. And uh, something unusual that uh, you may ask is uh, we also have representations from the United Kingdom, the United States of America, the Netherlands, France, and uh, from all these uh, last countries except the United States, they are represented from their territories. As of March 2011, 11 of those countries that uh, we have mentioned, which is approximately like 39%, are currently affected by the SCTLD. As we know, globally, reefs only encompass like around 0 0.09 of the world's oceans, but are incredibly diverse ecosystem that may host up to 3 million species that consist of, among others, corals, sponges, plants, dinoflagellates, cnidarians, echinoderms, fish, tunicates, and reptiles. And all several of these species have a very important role, not just in the ecosystems, but also in the economy. So therefore, uh, the protection of these uh, species that represent around 1.8 billion in the wider Caribbean region is very important. This value includes their contributions to tourism, fishing industry, and shoreline protection, all of which are under threat as this disease moves through the Caribbean. I am not going to entertain you more with more specificities because um, the experts are going to address this topic and we are very grateful with all the experts that have uh, supported us for this paper. But what I would like to say is that the stony coral tissue loss disease was first identified in 2014 off of uh, Virginia Key, Florida. And since then, this unprecedented coral disease has spread to the Caribbean. So we need to take it seriously. This is a transboundary issue, so it's critical to ensure a coordinated management response as countries address this, um, this challenge. An effective management response also requires cross-program collaboration to bridge marine ecosystems health and maritime sector links. Addressing this new threat requires coordination and partnerships, as explained before, and this is the way how the Secretariat works, building partnerships, and that's why today, one of our main partners over the years, the Global, uh, the Gulf and the Caribbean Fisheries Institute, is going to give us um, an explanation on how we are building this partnership, not just in this specific issue, but also with pollution, um, protected areas, and sargassum, among others. So. For us, it's very important that stakeholders to be aware, and that's why we are encouraging participation and also to support in your instances to mitigate and intervene as appropriate. Uh, this paper is a collaborative effort between the Secretariat of the Cartagena Convention and both protocols the concerning especially protected areas and the pollution from land based sources of uh, activities. With that saying, I would like to please invite Mr. Robert Glazer, Executive Director of the Gulf and Caribbean Fisheries Institute, to provide remarks. Please, Mr. Glazer, we uh, also would like to hear from you on the importance of these partnerships. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eliana, and very nice opening remarks. I think you set the stage very well. Um, I want to also uh, wish everybody good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, wherever you may be. I am pleased to be here today on behalf of the Gulf and Caribbean Fisheries Institute and our project partners to help roll out this white paper on stony coral tissue loss disease. First, I wanted to briefly introduce GCFI, an organization which many of you may be unfamiliar with. GCFI is a regional nonprofit which has been around since 1948. Our mission is to provide an impartial forum for discussing approaches to ensure the long-term sustainability of the region's marine resources and for assisting in developing capacity-related sustainability. Historically, we have focused on convening an annual institute somewhere in the region and printing the proceedings from the institute. The proceedings likely represent the longest-running record of marine science in the region. Uh, the conference itself brings together scientists, students, artisanal fishers, academics, NGOs, managers, and the private sector. GCFI also hosts the MPA Connect Network with our NOAA Coral Reef Conservation Program partners, 
and we are co-host with UNEP's Caribbean Environment Program of the Global Partnership on Marine Litters Caribbean Node. You'll be hearing more from our uh, co-host uh, Christopher Corbin later in this uh, presentation. We've also been closely um, working together on addressing the sargassum issue, lionfish issues, and other emerging topics that uh, present themselves. I could go on and on about our projects, but enough about GCFI. I'm really here to speak about the value of partnerships uh, to achieve real world results. The partnership that helped to create this document is somewhere, so much more than just UNEP and GCFI. The support and technical expertise came from many organizations and individuals all over the region and indeed the globe. In addition to Christine O'Sullivan and Emma Doyle with GCFI, I want to thank our partners at the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Coral Reef Conservation Program, who have been the guiding light on SCTLD activities. I also want to recognize Patricia Kramer and Judy Lang with AGRA, the Atlantic and Gulf Rapid Reef Assessment. And of course, I want to acknowledge the government of Sweden, Ministry of the Environment, who Ileana also mentioned, but they supported this effort and they have supported many others in the region. And uh, their support has been invaluable to achieve a lot of what has been achieved. Importantly, I want to speak about the value of partnerships. The SCTLD white paper is just one example of a comprehensive partnership that is strategic with real world results. That in and of itself is the very value of partnerships. Each person and organization that I mentioned with regards to this document contributed their knowledge and experience to the development. It would be far less comprehensive and therefore valuable if this document was created without that input. I know that this is self-evident, yet I wanted to emphasize the point that it is incumbent upon each of us to recognize that together we can achieve much more than we can on our own. Thank you, and I turn it back over to the moderator. Thank you, Bob, for your remarks, and thank you, Ileano, as well. For those of you who have just entered the, the meeting, the webinar, I just reintroduce myself. My name is Tamoy Singh. I'm Program Management Assistant at the UNEP Cartagena Convention Secretariat, and I'll be your moderator for the webinar. As mentioned before, we'll receive two presentations. The first is from Ms. Christina Sullivan, who is a consultant with the Gulf and Carbon Fisheries Institute. And Christine will present on the highlights of the report. And we'll also have a presentation from Ms. Frances Lean, Executive Director of the Rotan Marine Park. And she will present on building capacities for monitoring and intervention for SCTLD. I will now introduce our first speaker, Ms. Christina Sullivan is a senior lecturer in the Environmental Sciences Division at the University of Technology, Jamaica, and also assists with the implementation of the Gulf and Caribbean Fisheries Institute's MPA Connect program. She has a master's degree in natural resource management and marine mammal science from the University of the West Indies Cave Hill Campus and the University of St. Andrews, respectively. She has assisted MPA Connect with the development of resource materials on stony coral tissue loss disease that seek to improve capacity building efforts throughout the region. I now invite Christine to start our presentation. Christine, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Tamoy. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to discuss the white paper on stony coral tissue loss disease. GCFI appreciated the opportunity to collaborate with the United Nations Environment Programs Cartagena Convention Secretariat on this effort. And our work on the white paper reflects GCFI's mission to provide a platform for the exchange of information about the management of marine natural resources. While the cause or causes of stony coral tissue loss disease are still unknown, we do know that the disease is waterborne and transmitted through direct contact and it is more persistent and virulent than other coral diseases. It can cause 100% mortality in susceptible coral species within weeks to months and could potentially have devastating effects on the reefs throughout the wider Caribbean region. The white paper was developed to provide policymakers, natural resource managers and field practitioners with relevant up-to-date information to aid in the identification, monitoring and management of the disease. All the information in the white paper reflects the latest, most credible science and the best practices shared by key regional partners, including NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program and experts at Nova Southeastern University. 
My co-authors are Emma Doyle from MPA Connect, which is a partnership initiative between GCFI and NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program, and Patricia Kramer and Judy Lang from Atlantic and Gulf Rapid Reef Assessment, or AGRA. We've made an effort to design the document with clarity and user friendliness in mind, so the document is illustrated with images of the disease and case studies from Caribbean coral reef managers. My presentation today will provide a brief outline of the different sections of the white paper and the information contained within each section. As outlined in the table of contents, the white paper gives a comprehensive examination of stony coral tissue loss diseases, potential impacts to coral reef ecosystems, how to distinguish the disease from other diseases and non-disease factors, the most appropriate monitoring and management practices, recommended next steps, and the resources available to natural resource managers and field practitioners in order to develop their own management and intervention strategies. Next slide, please. The executive summary provides a brief synopsis of the document, including an overview of why coral reefs are important and the devastating impacts that stony coral tissue loss disease may have on reef-based ecosystems. Recommendations for policymakers, natural resource managers, and key stakeholders are also included to, prove, to improve stakeholder awareness and help reduce the transmission of the disease throughout the wider Caribbean region. In the introduction, you'll find information on the countries and territories throughout the wider Caribbean region that as of March 2021 had been affected by stony coral tissue loss disease. This section summarizes how to identify stony coral tissue loss disease, the coral species susceptible to the disease, and the potential impacts the disease may have on coral reef ecosystems. Coral reefs are extremely important to the economies of countries and territories throughout the wider Caribbean region, particularly with respect to their contributions to shoreline protection and the tourism and fishing industries. In 2018, for example, Reef-associated tourism within the Caribbean was valued at over 7.9 billion US dollars. However, the provision of these goods and services are heavily dependent on the health of these critical ecosystems. This section of the white paper presents the impact stony coral tissue loss disease could have on coral reef ecosystems and the ecosystem services that they provide, including their contributions to shoreline protection and the tourism and fishing industries. Since stony coral tissue loss disease is a transboundary issue, it is important to ensure coordinated management between countries and territories and regional initiatives. The section on SCTLD's institutional context describes the regional and local governance frameworks that are relevant for the prevention of and mitigation against stony coral tissue loss disease. It also presents the collaborations, networks, and partnerships that currently exist to share information and build capacity for disease response. This includes Florida's Stony Coral Tissue Loss Disease Responses Caribbean Cooperation Team, which is co-hosted by NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program and AGRA. Stony Coral Tissue Loss Disease has similar characteristics to other diseases, such as white band disease and yellow blotch disease, as well as non-disease events like predation and coral bleaching. This section will help you to correctly identify the stony coral tissue loss disease by describing its characteristics, outlining the similarities and differences between SCTLD and other diseases found within the Caribbean, and by identifying the distinguishing characteristics of non-disease events. There is a lot of interest in the causes of stony coral tissue loss disease and the factors linked to its spread, so a section of the white paper is dedicated to what is known about possible causes and means of transmission, such as links with dredging and sediment transport, shipping and the release of ballast water and biofilms. Monitoring needs with respect to stony coral tissue loss disease will vary depending on whether or not the disease has already been identified within a country or territory's waters. This section provides monitoring guidelines, data sheets and recommendations depending on an area's monitoring objectives and capacity levels in order to assist with the development of local and site-specific monitoring and intervention plans. We also feature three case studies from the Grenadines Network of MPAs, the Turks and Caicos Islands, and Roatan Honduras that provide examples of monitoring efforts throughout the region, 
that are based on specific monitoring objectives and the inclusion of community researchers in field work. The management section provides resource materials and recommendations and how to effectively respond to stony coral tissue loss disease with management actions. The section starts with addressing how to effectively communicate issues associated with the disease to a wide cross section of stakeholders in order to ensure that audience appropriate information is relayed to relevant stakeholders. This section then presents the role of multi-sectoral partnerships, provides guidance on response planning, and describes the most recommended approaches to prevention, reducing stressors, and managing data. This is the section to go to for the latest best practices to guide efforts related to treatment, coral rescue, restoration, research, and capacity building efforts. A concerted effort must be made by all stakeholders throughout the region to implement practices that will effectively limit the transmission of stony coral tissue loss disease and minimize its impact on coral reef ecosystems, both within and outside of the wider Caribbean region. This section provides recommendations at the individual, local, national, regional, and international levels that are designed to minimize the spread of the disease. Although it's still a relatively new issue, this coral disease has been the topic of intensive capacity building and experience sharing. This section provides information on the many resource materials that are currently available and how to access them. This includes materials on how to monitor for and correctly identify stony coral tissue loss disease, communicate about the disease, plan a coordinated disease response effort, and develop best practices for treating corals affected by stony coral tissue loss disease. For example, the white paper contains links to the resources that MPA Connect and AGRA have developed to assist with the identification, management, and treatment of the disease. While this is not a section in the report, I just wanted to say that I hope you will find the white paper useful. The disease is relatively new and researchers are still learning about the disease. As more is learned and it continues to spread throughout the wider Caribbean region, we hope that the white paper will be updated periodically to ensure that stakeholders have information on the causes and spread of the disease, the most recent treatment practices, available educational materials and monitoring protocols. And finally, it would be remiss of me to not thank the organizations who helped create the white paper, either by providing pictures, sharing their experiences, or reviewing earlier drafts. They include NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program, the Atlantic and Gulf Rapid Reef Assessment, the Turks and Caicos Reef Fund, the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, Nova Southeastern University, Roatan Marine Park, Sustainable Grenadines Incorporated, and the Honduran Coral Reef Foundation. I would also like to thank the many resource managers, field practitioners, and researchers who are actively working on combating the disease. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine, for presenting highlights of the report. A link to the report um, will be provided in the chat for you to be able to review for yourself. And this report is a much needed um, um, document on this issue, especially as mentioned, that it's a transboundary issue. So it's not only affecting one area, it affects a wide cross section of areas and the importance of coordinated management is needed for an issue of this um, type. Also, it provides the information on how to identify the causes and monitoring, making it a very useful resource and further research can be done and to be added to this resource as time goes on. So thank you very much, Christine. It was a very interesting presentation. And now we're going to move on to our next speaker. And this is Ms. Frances Lean. And Ms. Lean is an environmental sciences professional with a master's degree in urban environmental management from Wagon Wageningen University and the Institute of Housing and Urban Development Studies in the Netherlands. As the executive director of the Rotan Marine Park, she leads their efforts supporting conservation for marine and coastal ecosystems in the Bay Area Islands, Honduras. Francis provided consulting and technical services to local industries to, to solve regulatory, environmental, and safety issues. She's also a certified dive master 
and conservation volunteer and is committed to protecting coral reefs, marine environments, as well as the local community's well-being. I invite Francis to start her presentation. Francis, you have the floor. Thank you very much for that great presentation. And it's really great to, to uh, hear right now Christine's um, presentations. And thank you so much for inviting us. So my name is, as you mentioned, Francis Lane. I am the executive director of the Roatan Marine Park, and which is a nonprofit organization that protects marine and coastal ecosystems in the Bay Islands National Marine Park. National Marine Park. Um, you can move to the next slide. I don't know if I can. So um, in 2019, we were invited to a, a knowledge exchange led by MPA Connect, where participants from different countries that had SCTLD attended. At that time, Honduras didn't have the disease. So we learned how to identify it, uh, how to monitor it, and how to treat the disease. Um, uh, next slide. Okay, so after this exchange, MPA Connect developed these posters and they were delivered to our offices. And then when we set it up in all the dive shops around the island, we actually shared them with the other two islands, with the Utiland Guanaja, which are part of the Balance National Marine Park. So in 2020, we started uh, monitoring each site. We had a few funds, then we started monitoring eight dives, eight sites. How do we identify, we actually identified those sites. We actually uh, based this on high coral coverage of susceptible species from the AGRA report. So that's where we said, okay, let's, let's uh, do monitoring, monthly monitoring on this eight sites. Um, Unfortunately, in September 2020, uh, we received a citizen report regarding colonies presenting SCTLD characteristics. Uh, we confirmed the presence in the south side of the island and where we actually identify, uh, identify rapid tissue loss in different colonies. I think you go to the next slides where you can see uh, rapid tissue loss in maize corals, pillar corals, and star corals. So in 2021, this year, actually the Swiss cooperation helped us um, increase the number of sites that we monitor. So instead of eight, we increased to 21 sites all around the island. And per our monitoring activities, we do it every month and 85% since 2020, 20, September 2020, when we found the disease till now, 85% of the island has the presence of stony coral tissue loss disease. We only have this area on the east side, uh, three monitoring points where we have not uh, identified the presence so far. So that's the only area that doesn't have the disease. And thanks to actually monitors to the, all the efforts that the Bay Islands National, National Marine Park Technical, Technical Committee has done, uh, we have been able to do for over 5,000 treatments at 60 sites. This has been a very, it's a very good partnership within the local community, the international community to help us guide on how to do these treatments. And this has been an amazing effort, I believe, in the Mesoamerican Reef. And we couldn't have done this, we couldn't have accomplished this task of 5,000 treatment if it wasn't for the community members. We actually have a community outreach program and we actually trained community members on how to identify the disease, how to identify the susceptible corals, um, all the dive operations, the participation from all the dive operations and volunteers have been paramount for our activities regarding stony coral tissue loss disease. Um, if you see on the, I think on the previous slide, we can see all that we have trained over 17, uh, we've done over 17 workshop where we train uh, on how to identify, monitor and uh, treat the disease. And we have trained over th 303 people or persons, and we have worked with 30 volunteers who are permanently or constantly working with, with the Rotem Marine Park supporting our activities regarding SCTLD. So we did a science, uh, citizen science data collection. I can go to the next slide, where we have actually received reports from 150 
uh, tags, pictures of the tags, uh, email to us. So that keeps the community engaged, the diving community engaged and involved in all our activities and interested actually in the activities that we do. And they're actually aware of the disease and try to help. So that really uh, has contributed to all the work that we have done. And um, so how do we find the tags? When we started doing the uh, treatment, we had to go do the treatment and afterwards find the tags. Uh, it was a little bit hard at the beginning. And when we used to go back and do the monitoring, we could only find maybe just 60% of the tags because it's really hard on the location. But one of the volunteers came up with the idea of doing maps. So where you can see there at every site, there is a map and there is a, uh, a location where the, with the number uh, of the tag that they set. So when they go back now on the first dive, they find actually 100% of the tags. Before it used to be 60% of the first dive, I had to do two dives, but now we have been very successful on finding and being able to monitor. So all the activities, these are what the dive shops actually do. So the tag hunt week, the we try to do this uh, tag hunt where we gave prices. I think we tried to do it during the Easter break. This wasn't very successful, I believe, because we didn't have that many divers in the water after COVID. We reduced the number of visitors. So this wasn't a very successful, but we're trying different venues to actually get people to report it, to report the tags. And to continue our partnership, we actually did training in July this year uh, with all the co-managers from the Caribbean, Honduran uh, marine protected areas and other organizations and institutions where we also train them how to do, how to, how to identify the disease, how to monitor and how to treat it because this is not yet in on this areas, but we want them to be prepared in case uh, when it comes to their, to their site. And this was sponsored by the Minister of Tourism. So we had a program that said that it's called Adopt a uh, Dive Sites. This is where the dive shops have agreed. We have an agreement with them where they um, do the treatment, do ID and monitoring, and they will, the RMP will provide the supplies and the training to their staff to actually uh, treat the corals and monitor it. They will provide the data to us. And this has been very successful. We currently have 10 dive shops actually supporting this activities. And then we continue doing, providing awareness in all the dive shop. We pre prepared this poster, so uh, which are guidelines on how to de disinfect your gear when you come diving and after diving, after doing the dive, that way you don't spread the disease. And on the management side, um, thanks to the Swiss Corporation and to Mar Fund, we actually were able to create a national action plan for SCTLD in Honduras. Right now, it is in a draft, it has been completed, but it's a draft and we're just waiting for the government to review and approve this uh, draft. And our next step, we're hoping that to restore our reef, we're looking at setting up a coral restoration center of Roatan to do some microfragmentation and assist, assisted sexual reproduction. We're doing this in cooperation with our partners as well. And lessons learned always involve a wide range, a wide range of stakeholders in all your activities. That's what we have done. It has helped us a lot to involve all the dive shops, politicians, and the local community. Carry out monitoring uh, in the strategic places. Um, make sure you do the maps. That's very important. And manage expectations. Sometimes people think that by doing the intervention, uh, we're going to save the reef or we're going to stop the disease. So make sure that everyone gets the proper information and also prioritize your mental health is really and that of your team because it's really devastated and heartbreaking whenever you get in the water and see the disease. So uh, always prioritize on taking care of your team and their health, mental health. And on a good note, uh, you will see this picture. Um, there is a coral, a very resilient coral in between two corals that were uh, had the disease, and so that means we have resilient ones, and we still have hope that we can uh, save a reef or uh, that our corals will be resilient to the disease. And um, then at the end, I want to thank to all of our partners, GCFI, MPA Connect, the Swiss Corporations, the Balance National Marine Park, Marfund, and everyone who has supported us throughout 
by giving us throughout this process, by giving us guidance, by supporting, by funding technical support. So thank you so much to everyone. And also with, I don't want to be left out our research team, which has been working around the clock uh, on this uh, monitoring treatment and following up with all our partners. So thank you so much. And if you want to contact us or more information of the Royal Tamarind Park, here's our information. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Francis, for your very interesting presentation. Um, excellent work by the Rotan Marine Park on the stony coral TC loss disease, increasing the number of sites from 8 to 21. Um, the importance of the community that even came out in the lessons learned. Community outreach is very important, as well as citizen science, because you are not able to do it on your own. You need the help of the community to get more awareness about the issue, as well as to assist with the monitoring of it and, and finding innovative ways to find the tags as well. I, I know that you said that um, the initiative was not successful, but uh, as you keep um, going along, I know that you know your work will, um, will bear fruit. And um, so thank you very much and a very interesting presentation. I will now move on to ask anyone if they have any questions that this is now the time to ask these questions so um janelle are there any questions in the chat for our presenters no questions so far no questions so far okay that means every, all information was very clear and that's very good and they have the link to the report so if you do have any questions um, you can um, we'll, you can think about it. We'll um, now ask Mr. Christopher Corbin or Program Officer for the Assessment and Management of Environmental Pollution Subprogram here at the Secretariat to provide closing remarks. However, oh, I think there's a question there from Chris. Um, Janelle? Yes. What is the latest science showing about the causes? Um, either Christine, Bob, or or Francis, any of you can take that question. What is the latest science showing about the causes? What is the latest science showing about the causes? Um, Tamoy, I actually think that that would actually be best done answered by Judy Lang, who is our who is the science director at the Atlantic and Gulf Rapid Reef Assessment and one of the co-authors of the paper. I think she would be best able to answer that. OK, thanks, Christine. Um, Janelle, can you give Judy Lang um, permission to speak? Sure. Thank you. OK, um, until Miss Lang speaks, I see there's another question, Janelle, in the chat. Um, this is from Aria. Right. Aria asked, has any genetic work been done on the corals? For example, on the resilient corals seen in this in this last slide. So has there been any genetic work on corals as the one pictured in the last slide? Francis or um, Francis, uh, will you be able to take that question? Actually, um, we I do not know the results of the genetic testing, but I know that there's been a uh, George Mason University, some members from this university coming to the Bay Islands to uh, collect tissues and do some genetic work on this type of corals. OK, thanks, Francis. Um, is Judy, able to, Judy Lang able to take the floor? Ms. Lang, could you type in the chat if you're unable to mute your mic? Because it's fine on my side. Thank you. OK, um, Judy said that she will provide her answer in the chat as she's she's not able to unmute her mic. And she has um, she had provided that answer there. Do we have any other questions? 
If there are any additional questions after we close this webinar, please feel free to email, um, email us um, any questions that you have. Um, you can put my email in the chat, Janelle, tamoy.sing at un.org. If you have any additional questions with regards to the presentations or the white paper that was presented. And Patricia, I see Patricia is providing some additional resources on the genetics. Okay. Um, if there are no further, okay. Um, Ileana's asked Patricia if she wishes to answer the question. Okay, Judith is still unable to speak. She, so she's providing the response in the chat. Okay. If there are no other questions, I will ask Mr. Christopher Corbin, Corbin um, Program Officer for the Assessment and Management of Environmental Pollution, the AMEP subprogram, to provide closing remarks. Um, there is a question here from Cayman Islands. Um, yes. They have asked, who are you collaborating with in Rotan to build Aquaria? Francis, that's a question for you. Yes, we're currently collaborating with um, all the with the AKR Anthony's Key Resort and RIMS, uh, Rotan Institute for Marine Sciences, and also we are collaborating with Dr. Robin Smith. He's been supporting us on the creation of the uh, the Coral Restoration Center that we want to set up. And have you considered the cryopreservation technique? Actually, no, we have considered it. However, I don't right now we don't have the capabilities to actually do that. And we're trying to like fundraise right now for to do start with micro fragmentation, then move to uh, sexual reproduction. And if later on, maybe work with the universities in Mexico to do cryo uh, preservation. Thank you. Thank you, Francis, for providing an answer to that question. Chris, um, can you take the floor? Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Tomoy. I, I was just waiting in case any of the other participants had any additional questions or comments. So again, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Uh, first of all, on, on behalf of the Cartagena Convention Secretariat, before I thank any of the authors or any of my colleagues, I'd, I'd really like to express our appreciation for all of the participants who join for this launch. In a day where we have so many other competing virtual events and meetings and webinars and seminars, to have over 70 persons participate in this launch is really a tremendous achievement. And, and I'd like to, to congratulate uh, GCFI, to, to Ileana and her team, and to all of those who have joined, who have really raise this as a, as a significant issue that needs to be addressed. Uh, one may find it interesting that as the Marine Pollution Program Manager that I am delivering the closing remarks, but as Ileana and Bob mentioned during the start of this launch, this is really about us collectively being more integrated in how we approach the very many challenges that our region faces. This is no longer about just focusing on a marine biodiversity challenge or a disease that's affecting our coral reefs. It's also about addressing our pollution issues, both from land and marine-based sources, and how we engage citizens, how we, how we use citizen science how do we foster and enhance the partnerships between civil society, between our non-governmental organizations, between our research institutes, government agencies? And we believe that as a secretariat, we are best placed to facilitate uh, those sorts of partnerships and connections. As has been mentioned, we were just a catalyst. Many, many other agencies, and I don't want to mention any in the case I leave out someone, have really been working together collectively and as a network to address this challenge. We have found it particularly interesting because of the opportunity 
to link with our work on pollution, particularly the work being led by our regional activity center, Rack Rempatech in Curacao, who works to support the Ballast Water Convention of the International Maritime Organization. As has been mentioned in the presentation by Christine, the role of shipping and or ballast water in terms of uh, transferring the problem, causing the problem to be, to be spread through the region needs to be looked at. And the element of disease, and a lot of recent research papers have demonstrated that the discharge of partially treated or untreated domestic wastewater or sewage can cause severe diseases within coral and make them then more susceptible uh, to this particular stony tissue, stony coral tissue loss disease. Anyone else going to get that, that wrong? But I think what we have heard here over the last 50 minutes is the, the commitment that all of the partners have to work on this as an issue. As has been mentioned, we hope the white paper is not the end, but really just the beginning of bringing together some ideas, some recommendations, but our work is certainly far from done. And I'd, I'd really like to express our commitment as a secretariat to continue working with all of the stakeholders as we take a more integrated approach to environmental assessment, that we start breaking down these, these artificial barriers. We have one Caribbean Sea that our livelihoods are dependent on, and therefore it's in our interest to work together for this. So again, congratulations to the entire team who worked on this paper, and we look forward to future collaboration. Thanks so much. And back over to you, I think, Tomoy. Yes, thank you very much, Chris, for those very good closing remarks. I want to thank everyone who has joined us today to listen to the highlights of the report for the stony coral tissue loss disease, as well as the work done by the Rotan Marine Park. Um, both the paper and the work done by Rotan, very excellent um, examples of um, work being done on stony coral tissue loss disease. And as Chris mentioned, that this is not the end of the work, and this is just the beginning. So more work to be done, um, more countries to be involved, and, and increased information to be found for uh, another paper. Uh, thank you so much again for joining us. And thanks to um, my team at UNEP for their support in putting together this webinar. And uh, we look forward to inviting you to future webinars on as we have a number of issues that we always want to um, make people aware of. And so we will be in touch and, and thank you again. <laughs>